loud. All right, we are now um, officially recording. So Ryan, take it away. All right, it's official. Here we are in time space continuum, right? All at the same time. Um, so I think a number of you were together with me when we talked about this and looked at these results together at the conference. I know Kathy was, I know Ruth was, right, Ruth? Um, and Bonnie was, for sure. We were part of our conversation. But Allison, Kelly, and Kara, were you? Okay, yeah, you get a thumbs up. Were, is this, is this new or this old? Were you with us at the conference or not? Uh, new to me. New to me, okay, very good, Kelly. Kara? Um, no, I wasn't with you at the conference. Okay, that's great. This All is, right, so we got, we this a mixed is Allison, bag. I was not at the conference either. Okay, very good. All right, Allison, great. So we got a bit of a mixed bag. So I had the presentation for the conf conference. So uh, I'll go I'll go through that. Um, and then, but I think this being a smaller group and kind of engender a little more conversation uh, amongst you all, maybe some in preparation as you look towards that Farm Financial Institute thing uh, with Tara Johnson, but uh, the other part certainly are the, the farmer farm financials and we'll stop and have that conversation after that part because we really have two parts. The beginning part, farm finances, second part, market finances. And uh, let's have a discussion point at each, go from there. So I'm gonna present, I'm gonna, uh, uh, because it, it's too hard for me just to spitball numbers off the top of my head. And uh, I would just be making them up if I didn't have them in front of me. <laughs> and so let's, uh, there we go. We see it, right, Jan? Yeah. Okay. You know this. This is me. I'm Ryan Pesh, Extension Educator. I always introduce myself on these things just because, you know, why I end up getting involved in most of these things is because I play both sides of the field, if you will, as Ryan Pesh, Extension Educator, who plays with spreadsheets and Ryan Pesh, uh, veggie farmer. Um, boy, it just kind of bothers me here, hold on. There we go. I cover, I'm covering up my children, I guess. So yes, I've been at this, as I told somebody, I'm in year 20 now as a commercial vegetable operator, which is hard to believe, <laughs> but it is, it's true. So um, I guess I'm supposed to know what I'm talking about at this point but i've done farmers markets we do i've done farm stand i've done csa wholesale all this kind of stuff and i do think um my own point of view as i approach these things is that most of us who are commercial vegetable operators a lot of us are doing what we call we're mixing outlets and we're mixing market channels we have a diverse a lot of people have a very diverse uh what we call a marketing mix and so Part of this research is understanding people's marketing mix and where they're selling product. So there's, when we talk about farm finances, we're gonna talk, there are costs obviously to raising produce, but there's also very real costs in terms of marketing that produce. And if the produce costs are held constant, that is what it costs to produce something. Uh, the big differential in is kind of how things are priced and the cost related to how they're sold. And so that's that's part of this research. And um, personally, that's something that I've, I've realized over the years and tried to be strategic about in order to make my farm overall more profitable by paying attention about how I sell things just as much as how uh, how I grow things, right? So that's by way of introduction. So we'll look at uh, data from producers. We'll look at, um, like I said, a little, little on this marketing mix analysis and then some information um, by market. And, and I think obviously you guys have the most to say about that profitability by market, but I hope that this beginning part may gives you an appreciation about what the economics look like from the point of view of your producers that you want to engage in the market, right? So if you have a better understanding about uh, how they think about, and I'm not saying all of them will think about it the same way, but generally speaking, what are their economics and what does that look like to them 
uh, it give you some insight into uh, how you might present the aggregation project to them. So in terms of the farms that uh, participated <clears throat> in our study, uh, we had 17 and all of these are commercial vegetable producers, uh, various scales, sizes and types, right? Um, most of them are, would say that they're primarily vegetable people. There are a couple in here that are like, they have another enterprise that's also fairly important. That's also that they combine with the vegetable enterprise, right? So the farm business management language is we talk about operations and in the operations, there's multiple enterprises. And so all of these op operations have a vegetable enterprise and a couple of them have some other enterprises. So you might do pasture poultry. I did this for a long time. <laughs> I, I raised bro broilers, I sold broilers, and then I did produce. Um, and so that's, it's a mixing of enterprises. The, the big headline, when we think about these 17 farm op operations, this is a case with the other, other times I've collected data from um, veg commercial vegetable operators. There's a huge variation. The variability is kind of insane. And so that is something that's, um, that cuts across commercial vegetable operations in a way that it doesn't uh, commodity crops. And so um, in, in, our, in this study, we, this, the smallest had 1,600 in sales. The largest did um, 200 and quarter million, <laughs> push, push and quarter million sales. And then you get a sense of the size. I mean, we had a number that were, I think with three of them that were what we'll call a micro farm or less than an acre. Uh, and the biggest was was 22 acres of, and that's of uh, vegetables. That's not of, uh, this, that's not the total size of the farm. Maybe the farm's 80 acres in size, but 22 of the 80 are in vegetables. So that's the size of the vegetable production. Again, a lot of variability in terms of the operating profit margins of these farms. Um, smaller scale farm had lowest, um, uh, profit margin. Again, it's some of these, some of these numbers get, um, can get big, especially if you're thinking of a small farm, right? The same thing if we're talking about like population in Cook County, you're like, oh, Cook County, you got, it grew by 30%. Well, Cook County might, is a tiny county to begin with in terms of population, right? So you see it, it, it percentage wise makes it look like a very big jump. If you're a small operation, you have, like, you're like, oh my goodness. 254, a negative 254 percent operating mark, pro, operating profit margin. You'd be like, these people are out of business. Well, if it's a small farm, and you're doing, you know, three thousand dollars in sales or two thousand dollars in sales, it actually isn't as crazy as <laughs> you might think. The highest was 73 uh, percent, and so operating profit margin is if we take out all the all the operating costs, the total amount of money that came in, and let's take out all the marketing costs and the production costs, the cost for that that year. Um, I believe depreciation is not part of an operating profit margin. Then we, then we do is uh, let's do a, a gross margin. And, and this is where we get into this uh, uh, marketing uh, mix analysis. Um, and so in the, the gross margin, the way we want to understand it is um, for every dollar of sale, say at a farmer's market, what, uh, how many cents are kept uh, after you take out the marketing costs? So I have very real marketing costs to go sell to a market. I have the time at a market. I've traveled to a market. I have the cost of, of the market fees, uh, all these kinds of things. If we add all that up and, and we subtract, we take that out of the sales at that market. What's the gross margin? How many, if I'm, for every dollar sale, I'm losing a quarter just on marketing costs or am I, am I losing 30 cents on marketing costs? I'm keeping 70 cents or I'm keeping 75 cents. Somebody put something in the chat. I don't, I don't see it. Is there a question? Is labor included in the operating profit margin? Nope, not, uh, it can be. In this case, it is not. So um, uh, what we have with these 17 farms is that they're, oh, with, <laughs> very small exceptions it's it's almost all what we'd call proprietor labor 
And that's, you know, the families of the farm that own the farm, operate the farm. Uh, and then there's very, a very minor amount of, of, of labor costs that are attracted. So in the study, I didn't say, hey, uh, how many, I've done this before and it's actually kind of hard because we keep very bad records of our time <laughs> as farmers. How much time do you spend each week on production, da, 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 da. The only part of labor that is included because I wanted to have a closer examination of it is this part about marketing costs. So in marketing costs, we do, there, there is a, a time component and we put everybody at um, just $10 an hour or 10 or 15, well, one of the two, but it's consistent across all farms. One farm might say, my times were $22. Another person says, my times were six bucks an hour. I don't know. But for an apples to apples comparison, there is a time component for marketing costs because we wanted to tease those out. And so you'll see a little bit later. So uh, in terms of financial performance, we uh, just put this in a comparison with other studies that I've done. Uh, the one before this was in 2015. We had, we had 2015 data that we put out in 2016. Um, and in terms of performance, yeah, I mean, these farms really aren't too different from the farms that I've worked with before and collected data from before. So it's, you see the total sales per acre, 9,000 and some change to nine and 10,000. And that's in keeping with uh, research in Minnesota and in the upper Midwest on a per acre basis over a number of projects. So this is, this is fairly consistent. We see some differences in net return per acre that does keep, uh, that does include uh, depreciation. And my previous group was negative, this one's positive. If we just look at vegetables, there's a uh, cost per acre of vegetables. Uh, we break this out in terms of direct costs and overhead costs. Direct costs being those production costs such as fertilizer, uh, seeds, things like that. What are variable costs that we put into uh, growing, growing vegetables? Overhead costs are things like marketing costs, but also things like um, office costs, advertising costs, uh, capital costs, uh, these types of things that are that kind of are part of the whole operation, uh, not just for uh, vegetable production in particular. Insurance costs, uh, the cost of rent or the cost of, uh, um, of machinery is an overhead cost. So again, I mean, in terms of direct, we see some differences between these two groups, but I won't go too deep into this. Uh, in terms of whole farm, uh, the, again, this is at the operation level, the whole operation, all, all enterprises. Um, we see uh, their rate of return on assets, very similar to our previous group. So I like to think of this as like, a person could take, if they had a pot of money, they could invest in a lot of different things. You could go put it in an index fund and get a return, or you might buy a piece of equipment for your farm. And then what is that return? And so that's, that's what we, uh, we see here. It's very similar to previous groups. And then uh, operating profit margin uh, was higher uh, in this group uh, than it was uh, in my previous group at, at 30, 36%. So Again, that's that's a margin, so it's sort of like for every dollar of, of sale overall for the whole farm, uh, people are keeping 30, 36 cents of that dollar of sale. It's kind so of that was your point. earlier group though, right? The 2015. Oh, this is 2015, yes. They're keeping 25 cents. Thank you, Jen. Help me read my own graphs. Yeah. Um, also in terms of, of uh, whole farm, we see have a, uh, there's too many, details to these things, but uh, change of total net worth is a good one. These, these, these folks uh, did a more significant change in total net worth. This is sort of a balance sheet measure, right? Total assets minus total liabilities. Are you worth, I <laughs> like the thing is like, if I look at my balance sheet, am I worth more dead or alive kind of thing? And um, the, these folks actually grew quite significantly in, in their net worth. So they're either adding a lot of assets uh, they're adding more equipment or they're adding biz, uh, buildings or they're doing improvements on buildings um, or they're decreasing their, their debt. And so either of those things can improve the net worth, but essentially they improved their balance sheet quite a bit uh, during that year for the 2019 people, more so than the other the previous group. There I read it right, Jan. So 
Um, that's sort of the sort of like thumbnail sketch of of operations, kind of how are they performing these vegetable operations, and uh, those reports that went out to the different producers that participated. They're like, well, there's too much. <laughs> there's there's too much in a thin pack report because there are a lot of numbers on these things. Uh, and then um, Jane just recently helped me do more of a benchmark report. So it's sort of more of a clear, concise two page. How do I compare to the group situation? Uh, the idea is to have these numbers on hand and maybe track them over time. I mean, that's what I've, I've gotten to do. It's very helpful to start seeing a trend in your own operation and seeing how you compare to a group might make you think differently about how you would uh, change your operations. But that's, that's sort of more on the producer side, not your guys' side. Um, I think the big part that comes from what we got from the producers is this question about marketing costs. Uh, so I would say like not every sale is created equal. If, if I'm a farm here and I'm in Pelican Rapids in Ottertail County, if I drive down to St. Cloud to make a sale and it's a $10,000 sale in one day and it's like, oh, that's awesome. I got a market there. I do $10,000 a day. Um, that sale isn't created equal. I mean, if I had a $10,000 day in Detroit Lakes versus $10,000 in, in St. St. Cloud, just because of the marketing costs, everything else held equal. The dollar of sale in Detroit Lakes is worth more to me because I'm not, I, it's a lower, I have a lower margin. I have a lower market, re, I have a, a greater return over marketing costs. I just have more marketing costs to go sell in St. Cloud. And that's really what I'm getting at. There's time and costs involved. Uh, and there's a differential. Talking about that. So this is what we try to do uh, is to get across individual veg. Uh, operators outlets um, to identify as best we can. Sometimes this is kind of hard to pull apart. It really is. Um, but if you have a, a marketing mix, we'd call this a marketing mix. I'm a vegetable producer. I sell two farmers markets. I have a farm stand. I sell to a grocery and I sell to a school and I have total revenue across the whole season. And you see that laid out here at the top of this chart. And then I have marketing costs that are associated to each one of these things, right? So farmer's market A versus farmer's market B. Farmer's market A, I have much lower costs than I do farmer's market B or farmer's market two. Um, so what we do is we just do the calculations. We take the sales, we subtract out the marketing costs. So we get a net return, right? And then we, we turn that into a gross margin so that we can do an apples to apples comparison here as best we can. And what we do is we just take that net return and divide it by the total revenue. And so farmer's market A, we're keeping 47 cents of every dollar of sales at that farmer's market. Farmer's market two, because we have higher costs, we're keeping 23 cents of every dollar at that farmer's market. So I always advise producers to do this apples to apples comparison, especially if you have multiple outlets, five, six different outlets, because, um, you might, you should strategically say, okay, if the gross margin is so much less here, why am I doing this? Why don't I do, why don't I drop farmer's market two and sell more at farmer's market A or farmer's market one? <laughs> or if farm stand is such a high gross margin, why am I doing farmer's markets at all? And there's good reasons to do it, even if there's a low margin, right? But you need to do the apples to apples comparison to then say, well, what does that look like? So where do we stand with farmer, farmer's markets? These, again, the data from, um, this is how it lays out in terms of that marketing mix for the producers that were in our study. So the 17 producers, uh, where do farmer's markets stand? There's a 67% gross margin or return over marketing costs. So um, it's 317,000 in sales across those 17 operations. They spent all told, more than 100,000 in marketing costs. Again, that is some labor. Uh, we're trying to account for the labor and time at the farmer's market, but we're also accounting for those direct costs such as mileage um, and market fees and advertising for a farmer's market and stuff. At the bottom, you see this bar chart and this is how these gross margins compare across these different outlets or these different market channels. Uh, so farmer's markets are the lowest uh, that doesn't mean that they're the worst, right? There are reasons why people engage in the market outlets that they do. Um, direct here at 78% gross margin, 
is a direct to restaurant, a direct to grocery. Again, in terms of market, uh, in terms of marketing costs, you might have a larger order um, and or lower lower marketing costs. We also see in terms of teasing these things apart, some producers that get very good at setting a route. I go to a market and then I deliver or I, I deliver on my way to a farmer's market or I go to a farmer's market and then I deliver to these grocery stores or a restaurant on my way back. You know what I'm saying? So there's a lot of that stuff going on and I do my best to try to split it out. Uh, farm stand at 84% gross margin, CSA at 86 and wholesale at 92. But again, uh, with the wholesale, we are talking larger orders, much larger orders um, that very infrequent trips. So if you compare farmers markets to wholesale, what's the big difference? Because that's a fairly big difference. It's the matter of the trips that's going on here. A lot of these wholesale, looking at the data, for the wholesale people that engage in wholesale, big orders, you know, some of these people are like, I sell wholesale, I'm doing four, six uh, drop-offs in a year, but I'm doing a lot of a bigger drop-off in terms of the amount. And that's how that number gets to be as high as it is at 92% margin. What does this look like for the aggregation op operations and, and how does that uh, fit in with aggregation? So uh, when I did the report uh, beginning this, this summer, it seemed like a lot of the markets, uh, for an apples to apples comparison, a lot of the markets were at like a 14% margin, right? Like the, your market fees, I know there's some variability Right, and maybe that changed from 2019 to 2020. Um, but um, that's what I used in terms of a margin. So here is one aggregation farm. They did 90, $9,500 in sales. They reported to me that they had $100 in aggregation sales. That ain't much, okay? Because the headline here is that the aggregation didn't make a big, big change. These are 2019 data. It didn't make a big impact on their total sales really at all. I mean, it was, it's hard for me to kind of tease out because it's a small portion of the total sales. But here you see their costs at that farmer's market where aggregation was at in terms of their travel, time, selling time, travel time. Uh, so I translated that into a mileage cost, a travel time cost, selling time cost. Um, and then the number of trips. You see this, this particular farm, 25 times, that's that's a, uh, a fair number of times to go into the one farmer's market. This is somebody who's a very consistent vendor at that farmer's market. For example, when I did farmer's markets, I was down to you know, 17 times a year. It's only doing Saturday market kind of thing. So if we look at that and we did gross margin, that's 67 cents or keeping 67 cents of every dollar after you account for the, the um, uh, marketing costs. So how does this look like in terms of aggregation? The way I think about it is uh, the gross margin on aggregation is what 100 minus 0.14, right? You're at uh, 0.86. So any sale, even if you're taking out that uh, at a 0.86 is a higher number in terms of a gross margin or lower marketing costs in that gross margin that should improve that gross margin. If dollars, new dollars come in through aggregation sales, you catch my drift. It will improve their gross margin as long as it's not substituting from their other sales, which is hard to figure out. This is what it looks like as a market, as a, a producer grows in aggregation. Um, this is somebody, again, somebody's actual data. Um, and in terms of what their gross margin, this person's uh, gross margin at their farmer's market without an aggregation at all was, was 38%, right? That's, that's not great. That means they're their marketing costs are quite high. They're investing a lot to sell at that market. Uh, and um, they, they got up some sales in order to pay for what they're investing to go there each week, if you will. And so with aggregation, how does this margin change? Uh, and you just see how it, how it would affect that gross margin as we add in aggregation sales, right? Holding the other things cost, constant because a producer is, whole, is gonna incur these costs anyways whether there's aggregation or not. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. So we have to have some conversation or questions about just what we know about producers. It's 9.36, so I gotta stop being wordy. 
So Ryan, because I know that this was just 2019 data, in how many of the farmers were doing aggregation? And is it possible with those that were to go in and pull their data from 20, or at least to pull their sales data from 2020? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. We can totally do that. Um, of the 17, I want to say five had aggregation sales. Okay. That you'd count as aggregation sales because we worked hard at trying, you know, with the organizer trying to find a mix of people. People were in aggregation and people weren't in aggregation. People did only farmers markets and they did farmers markets and wholesale. Um, so yeah, we can totally do that. Um, and I think that would be very appropriate because we could assume, I think it'd be safely assumed without trying to suck up more time from a producer that their costs for that market are the same, right? If we just say, okay, if their costs for the market were the same and now we have more sales in 2020, how did that affect their gross margin 2019 to 2020? That'd be very easy to do. Mm -hmm. And if we want to, I mean, the, I think the, the only assumptions we might want to add is that they might have had some additional costs in terms of additional packaging that they had to do because of COVID or additional. Um, True. There may be there may be a couple more hours. And I don't know, I think probably the 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 managers could coordinators could estimate might be about estimate that. So we could look at some different scenarios, I guess is, yeah. is what I'm thinking. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think there definitely on. were similar hours for packaging. We heard that from vendors in Grand Rapids that doing the retail sales meant more time they had to spend, you know, kind of collecting product into the package sizes that the customers ordered and getting that labeled. Mm -hmm. So that was and I wonder cost. and I wonder if, if Ryan, if you captured that extra time as aggregation sales increase. There's time on the farmer side to make sure that that online platform is current. So you're always updating inventory, that kind of thing. Is that captured anywhere? You know, that isn't captured there because the ones that were involved in aggregation in 2019 that I was talking to, uh, with some exceptions, a number of them were like, well, Jane's nice enough. She gets that on the site, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that um, and, maybe, and maybe we capture that time on the market side because that's a, exactly what all the market managers said. As your sales, you know, as your activity increases, your manager time increases as well. So maybe we're right. capturing it on that side. That's right. All right. Well, and then I think there were also the scenarios where, at least early in the season, and this wasn't specialty crop. This was, you know, like bakers who who weren't doing the in person, were just doing online and so saving saving those four hours winter market standing at the market because they just brought their product and and left um so that could be fun to play around with some different scenarios of what those look like mm -hmm. yeah if you're able just to drop off and maybe you're putting four hours in on on a packaging time but you're not putting four hours in on selling time you assume that time is worth the same you're and what I think was interesting about that was that, you know, for some, you know, there, uh, and, and I'm thinking because I have most experience with the, the Rochester market, but, you know, there are, are certainly, um, and again, it, it tends to be the baked goods people, um, but they run out like within an hour. And so then they're, you know, they can't, they need to stay at the market. So they're just, you know, sitting there not doing anything. Um, which isn't, you know, a particularly good use of time. And yet I understand why the markets don't want people taking down mid market. Um, so anyhow, lots of. Yeah. And it just depends if they have a YouTube addiction and they can, you know, <laughs> then you just swap out that time to watch the videos you would do at home or scroll at right. home. Right. I mean, it depends who you are. Right. True. If it's keeping you from brain surgery where you do get, you know, $500 an hour or something, then it's a real yeah, significant yeah. thing. So, you know, I mean, that's where we come to all these opportunity costs, yeah. right? Um, which which I didn't try to sort out because yeah, yeah, everybody yeah. has different opportunity costs. Mm -hmm. um, patent attorneys versus, you know. 
you work at McDonald's and yeah. you're, not, you're not there, you're, you're working at McDonald's, it's it's kind of hard to, to sort out that time. Yeah, uh, that's how do you, how do you give that time yeah. a value? Right. We, we saw that at Grand Rapids with some vendors who were making different choices, and some of them were staying away from the market in person because of health concerns for themselves or family members. And mm -hmm. so they were thrilled with being able to just package their stuff at home, drop it off and not be at the market. And then other vendors who were having booth space at the market were feeling like it was a lot of extra time to do that packaging and labeling in addition to their, their booth. So mm -hmm. I think that's exactly what you're talking about with different choices and different opportunity costs, depending on situation. Yeah. But I think this slide here is one that really kind of tells a story of the promise of aggregation, right? There are all these sticky costs that are, that are very individual in terms of the time costs in order to do aggregation well if you are sinking more time, right? Just as you as managers, maybe, oh, sales went up, my time went up, right? Oh, aggregation sales here at Grand Rapids Market went up for me, that was great. But then I'm also investing this more of this time. Um, this one here, right? So I made this as sort of like, uh, <laughs> like your, your cost is the same, like, and then all you're doing is adding adding uh adding sales and that's really not true really this cost should curve up mm -hmm. i'm talking i'm now i'm like your economics high school economics <laughs> teacher this cost honestly in terms of marketing costs should go up for some people it goes up quicker and for some people it goes up slower right depending on how they can hold and manage that time uh for increased aggregation sales and that goes the same with you guys <laughs> as market managers too, how, how much is that, that cost curve go up? And that's not like Henry Kissinger or something. Okay. Um, I mean, I should just move on where, what we know about the markets and then we'll have more conversation unless there's a question. Do we understand this or am I just speaking gibberish? Uh, some of each. Yep. <laughs> some of each okay yeah. it's all about gross margins people and you only get producers if you can help them i think in terms of these marketing costs you help them increase that gross margin right i think that's a big thing because if that doesn't increase or, or do better why don't as a producer i just spend more time, energy, and effort onto that farm stand that actually is um, giving me a better return if my production costs are the same. See, I mean, that's the big thing. Um, we want to uh, entice producers to say, hey, you know what, those farmers market, market that, I know what you're spending and investing in the, coming to this farmers market. If we could improve your gross margin by adding on to these sales without adding, uh, the same marginal time, then we're getting somewhere. So that's your selling point and, and kind of how I think the producers, um, that's their reality in terms of where they, where they can sell. So what do we know about markets? Uh, here's 2018, 2019. I served this guy, this stuff to you a year ago or whatever. Yep, we had this little modest change and you know there was some change more so in some markets than others you guys already know this because they're your markets um and there was a change in terms of the of the suppliers that participated 2018 to 2019 some that dropped off some that added on um that's all that that slide's all about in terms of the average sales and the median sales um and at this time i was uh because of Sarah's work that she started in Wabash, I think in what, 2018, right, Sarah, with the market share um, and the, you know, packaging a CSA share or whatever uh, from multiple vendors. You know, we, I was, I examined this in particular because it seemed like an opportunity in order to bring in sales to, uh, to the markets. But, you know, average sales 2018 to 20, 2019, 
and the median uh, decreased uh, or that, that period of time. And, uh, and it's really driven because of the number of suppliers that, that increased, right? So we just had more suppliers across all the markets. And so instead of going from 39 to 51, then it's just sort of, uh, there are more suppliers that did smaller sales numbers is really the story um, with or without market share. 2020, you guys know this story. I don't know. I chalked it up as right time, right place. <laughs> you know, um, who knew a pandemic was coming? And uh, my God, it's like a whole different spreadsheet than what I, was, what I looked at in 2018, 2019. Uh, Sarah arranged from local line to get the data up until what the very end, the uh, third or the last week of October. And they got a data set and then Sarah got it, gave it to, gave it to me. So that's this data. Uh, maybe there was a sale afterwards that spilled into November and stuff. I don't got it. So um, if your sales look different, that probably is a big explanation of it. Uh, you see the change in transactions, uh, which is just off the charts. Um, and uh, you see the change, you see the sales per market, but you guys are the market managers. You don't need me to tell you this. Uh, in terms of suppliers, right, we had 51 in 2019. Um, according to local line, there were 125 that had sales. There were something like 13, 14 vendors that had no sales. They got on, they signed themselves up and never made it happen for whatever reason. Um, and in terms of sales uh, per supplier, it was quite a bit different as well. Um, average of 1,900, a medium of 366. Whenever you see a big difference between a, the average and the median, you just know that there are some, some operations that are doing large amounts of sales and there's, because that's why, that's why you get that spread between the average and the median, right? And, that, and that's what we see in the data. Think about like some meat vendors that had some big sales um, that sort of bring that number up quite a bit. And then a lot of other people, right? See the distribution is the high of $29,000 and the low of $2.50. All those people in that data set in the 125. So it's quite a spread. This is a product mix uh, from, oh, series one and series two. Series one is 2019 data. So the blue line is 2019. And the big story here is the change in 2019, I thought you guys were going all into market share <laughs> because that was more than 50% of sales in 2019 compared to all the products. Uh, and it was just barely on the scene in 2018. Um, and again, we get some wild changes. I mean, this is by percentage. So that introduction of a lot of sales in market share in 2019, throw these percentages off. Um, uh, you I mean, see, is that, so you have 2018, 2019, is that supposed to be 2019, 2020, or is that 2018, 2019? No, it's still 2018, 2019. Oh, okay. Because I wasn't able, I didn't have enough time to get the graph together. To get into For the 2020, okay. You know, because it's all these details, you got to take, you know how this stuff's organized in this, right? Like carrots are 18 different products, uh, you know, to get a carrot, a bar that says carrots, actually. Mm -hmm. So this is 2020 though. I mean, just the, the main highlights of it. Is it abundant COVID stress eating? Maybe, maybe. Meat and carbs ranked high. Um, you know, these are, these are your bakers, right, Jan? I mean, this, this was the highest baked good thing. Blueberry lime tart, tiny. $1,200 of those things were sold. Uh, bread. They're delicious. <laughs> they are, you know these, okay. <laughs> was this just those you, Jan? Actually... Maybe it was... <laughs> Those are actually one of our one of that farm's highest selling products like <laughs> for years, um, and it's one of those things where you can just make more. Um, yeah. It's not like bread where you have you know a batch of bread. So, <laughs> oh, I get you. People Honestly, they it. did well for them. That's good. <laughs> so we got bread again. We had the the whole meat thing. Um, Beef, chicken, pork was also upwards or close to 20,000 or uh, is 18,000 or something. It was well over, it's around 15. It's definitely over over 10. I'm, I'm trying to recall from my brain here. Beef, 22,000. 
but then in terms of produce, there isn't one that's sort of like this is high, high produce number, but um, because produce is sold across this wider mix. And so you guys essentially start, you're starting to look, when I put the numbers together, I'm like, you guys look like a grocery store. <laughs> and I, I do analysis on our co-op and it's like, it's really interesting to look at. It's very comparable. Um, and so yeah, tomatoes were the highest uh, vegetable sale at approaching 10,000. And then the market share, yeah, was there. Uh, but it's, as a percentage of sales, it was very minor in comparison to the 51% in 2019. Uh, which is kind of where you guys were heading more so. Uh, instead, you have a very uh, a wide distribution. You're saying you're looking like a grocery store. And so it makes me think that maybe the hub is actually, COVID allowed the hub to work the way it should or initially envisioned. Uh, that is a wide mix of products and people are going on and doing orders and ordering across a wide mix. Maybe market share was a bit of a, uh, a product band-aid in order to get people just buying through the through the hub you know i don't know that's just ryan's looking at but there's 20 more than 2400 items with sales so that, that's that's a wild, a wild mix. i'm just gonna jump in and say that because i had to do a report for the specialty crop yeah. grant um and i kind of split the numbers and it was about again lumping all of the specialty crops together it was about 50 50 in terms of Mm. total specialty crop sales, including, yep. you know, horticultural projects, which I know like in Rochester in the spring, there were a lot of bedding plants and things that were sold. Um, sure. But I mean, like you said, there's there's not, you know, tomatoes, there's not, you know, there, there's so many different vegetables that it broke down among a lot of uh, different things. Yep. Oh, oh and let me just... Uh, I think Bonnie has had a couple questions. Yeah, um, okay, Bonnie, what's the question? It seemed like people were trying to cover a large amount of their grocery list with their orders, especially early in the year, was a comment. Yeah. Um, and then there was an earlier question about, did the farmer receive, this goes to an earlier grant, did the farmer receive the $100 or did the customer spend the $100? I don't remember which graph. That was, that was about that 14% margin, right? Because we had the, what the farmer got and then 14 on top of that, which is what the customer was paying. Yep. I just wondered if, you know, if we were taking that 14% out of the hundred, if that was accurate. Yeah, the, the farmer received the hundred. And then my understanding is that 14 was then added and then put to the customer the farmer then received the hundred. So the upcharge, it was a, it's like a tax on top of the hundred dollars of sales. So yes, I, I don't want to get into this too much. The big, the big picture, like you guys gave all those uh, sustainability measurements end of 2019, right? Again, you're acting just like a grocery store in terms of Hey, we had more sales, but now we had more costs, right? Uh, so these sustainability numbers, right? I think whoever was with uh, Grand Rapids or whatever, right, Jane, on, at the conference was like, well, I don't know. I mean, initially we we're like Grand Rapids, what? You needed 30,000 to break even. I think you did more than $30,000 in sales here in 2020, but now your break even moved up, right? Maybe it's now 50 some thousand. And so again, it's those costs kind of go up as sales go up. And so you're, um, we're not surprised. The same thing happens in all businesses. Uh, it, isn't, it isn't just you guys, <laughs> don't beat yourself up. Um, I think the big question, and that maybe this is part of discussion as well as, you know, what do we do with the increasing costs to manage these markets as, as sales increases you know, will this stick? You know, this thing I, I, I wanted to talk about at, at the conference is, you know, again, you guys aren't different from other independent businesses at this time that have seen an increase in sales or an interest in uh, local and independent businesses. And 2021, 2021 could just be, hey, that was, that was interesting. Uh, now I'm just going to look for cheap peppers at Walmart again. 
or, oh, that was interesting. I really liked it. And I think it worked and I want to continue to, to buy that way. Um, so are people going to go back to their old habits? Are there going to be new relationships made? Is it just strictly a, a COVID bump uh, or a COVID bump that keeps 10% of those customers? Or is this just sort of like, this is just now how we do farmers markets. I don't know. Maybe you're on the cutting edge of, you know, model for the 21st century, but um I would like to ask some discussion or if you ask me questions about how we think about, you know, profitability for you guys at the market, at the market scale and the increased costs. I'm going to stop sharing this. Thanks. Okay, so when you guys got to say something. Okay, so um, you were wondering about, sorry, I was doing spreadsheets. Um, so you were wondering about um, whether or not people are going to stick with this. Mm -hmm. and what do you think? Um, and from what I'm hearing from my customers, they love it. They love the, the idea that they can get specialty things and then you know, they can just pick them up or they can have them delivered. Um, our delivery is still stupid cheap compared to, uh, you know, other grocery stores in town. Um, and you get better products and you get weird products, you know. Hy-Vee doesn't sell purple kohlrabi. Um, <laughs> so... I or, think or, that a lot of my Zuna customers, or yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, and I think a lot of my customers are going to stick with it. Um, a lot of them have pivoted from coming to the farmer's market once in a while when they can manage it to, you know, just ordering online. Um, I have people yeah. from out of town. I have people with strange jobs. You know, we have a lot of nurses and if you get off it, you know, 8.30 in the morning, you want to just pick up your stuff and then go home and go to bed. You don't want to wander around the farmer's market for an hour trying to find the right carrots. Um, so I think that this is going to, I think it's going to keep, um, I think this is the way. I mean, it's, it's 2020. People buy everything online. Um, if they didn't, Amazon wouldn't be as big as it is. So, um, no, I think I think at least in Rochester, if we can convince the farmers that this is something they want to continue, this will keep being something that we want that is profitable. Yep. So second question in terms of the cost, do your margins cover your costs? Yes. You're good. What do others say? Um yeah, our margins do not cover our costs. And so um, we've started thinking about this on kind of a continuum of, is this a business enterprise of the farmer's market or is it a community service of the farmer's market or a service to farmers? And kind of, you know, seeing where the markets fall on that continuum. And if it's a community service, but it actually is providing services that are useful to the community and the farmers, then, you know, what are the other ways that can be supported? That's kind of what we're looking at right now. Mm -hmm. For our market, it seemed like, you know, the major expense, right, is, is labor, is, is my time, basically. And um, because, you know, I would be spending that time and be paid you know, by my employer anyway, it's, it, I'm looking at it the same as Jane, where it's, um, it's a community service, right? We're a city run market. We're trying to be supportive of the, of the community and that's why we're having a market at all. Um, and so, you know, I think if we were an independent business trying to do this, it maybe wouldn't make sense to go forward, but I do plan to go forward um, Mm -hmm. because of how 
our particular numbers work out and, and what our mission is as a market. Sure. You have a sense, Bonnie, like your, if you take into consideration your time, it's like, say, oh, this is my time. My employer's paying it sort of like to you. It, it doesn't look too different, right? I'm on the clock one way or the other, but how, how far off are your covering your costs? Is it a magnitude of 500 bucks on either way, either side, or is it a magnitude of 10 grand? How far off are you if you bring in your labor covering? Um, I'd, I'd have to go back and look. Yeah. Hey, Bonnie. I'm such a spitballer. I always just try grand. to get. I always, what, it isn't 10 grand? Okay, it isn't 10. All right. So I'm always a spitballer. Let's just say, like, let's find the, the boundaries, right? If we're $300 off and it's like, oh, we, we can actually find those efficiencies to make this thing work. That, that's not an issue. Maybe in two grand. But if you have $30,000 in sales, but if you're off to the point of like, you need a $6,000 subsidy for this $30,000 in sales, it's this proportion, it's this proportion thing, right? Now, now you, now you have more of a, an existential question at hand, right? Does this make sense at all? As opposed to just finding efficiency. So I, you know, I mean, I, I guess that's the way I approach it or think it through. Annie, I'd like you to, can you, do you have any insight yet on how you're managing Minnetonka and the time there versus what you're doing in Richfield? Because I think that's critical. Yeah. So um, at the Minnetonka market, so I decided, right, that um, for winter, we should try to do pre-orders and we should try to do them in a somewhat organized fashion um, because of you know, what I thought our customer base in Minnetonka would prefer. Um, and I thought they would prefer mostly going onto one site to order. Um, and because some of those vendors um, cross over between Richfield and Minnetonka, I thought, why not look at local line? Um, I landed on the market version instead of the hub version uh, for a couple of reasons. The first reason was that um, our finance department didn't want us to uh, have to deal with, you know, collecting money and then reimbursing it through this website. They weren't comfortable with that. It was the, uh, I forget what it's called. It's the security around cards issue. Mm -hmm. um, and the other reason that I thought it was a good idea was that then um, Cottage Foods producers could be on there and they could charge they could charge their money and it would be just like normal because they're they're getting the money themselves directly and then you know delivering it directly so there's no problem with that and the difference in time for me is huge um, because essentially I don't have the ability to go on there and and change their products for them or or their inventory or things like that, unless I get special permissions set up. It's basically forced me to not hold their hand. <laughs> and it's um, it's kind of to the point where I said, okay, here's you know the resource you need to look at, the video you need to watch, here's you know the support from local line. Um, they can help you, but I can't help you um, specifically with this issue. And it just means that you know, it kind of almost runs itself from a market perspective. There's a whole lot less time going on in the in the market version of local line because the vendors have to be independent. Are you seeing a difference in, can you, I, I mean, it might be hard Apple to oranges in sales or is it about the same I bet you can't tell that because it's such, such different markets. I can't tell necessarily. Um, we've done, you know, two markets so oh. far in Minnetonka because it was only set up for winter. Um, so we had uh, the second Saturday of November and December. And then, um, you know, but there have been sales coming through. I mean, yeah, I haven't, yeah. I'm not sure how they compared exactly, but I do uh, plan to carry forward the market version of the local line for Minnetonka into the summer. 
Um, I'm pretty sure I have the support of, you know, my, my boss on that. So I'll be able to give you more information then. Bonnie, you have a question. I, I do too, Bonnie. We'll follow up. The only cost on that is to the vendor, right? The vendor pays 20 bucks a month. Is that it? There's no cost to you as the market, right? Right. So, well, the, yeah, in the end, there's no cost. The market's paying upfront local line uh, $20 per vendor per month. Um, and then you know, that's what we have decided to charge the vendor, just a very transparent. We're charging you what we're being charged for it. Um, you know, if you chose not to charge the vendor, then it would be $20 per vendor per month, which is kind of a lot. And you're not aggregating on site then. Each customer drives through and do they drive through to pick up or do they... They do actually, yeah, they do actually drive through. The whole market is drive through. Um, so we have pre-orders and on-site sales for that market and everyone's in their car. So we're set up in a parking lot. Each vendor has um, three parking spaces wide and that seems to be about perfect to allow someone to pull up and park their car in front of a vendor booth, stay in their driver's seat, talk to the vendor through their passenger window pick up their pre-order or read the menu of the vendor, pick out what they want, buy it, and they're on their way. I'd say, Ryan, this, this yeah. is Kelly. I've got to drop off, but to answer your question on part of our market, yeah. uh, I, I think the answer is no, it, it doesn't cover the costs, but it that option brought new uh, customers mm -hmm. to our market. They purchased more as far as those who showed up live as opposed to online, they, they ordered more online. Mm -hmm. um, the vendors who participated liked it, the customers who participated for the most part liked it. And so long as that, so long as we can keep finding a funding source for the license fee, we view it as a positive add-on looking at the profitability as a whole as an add-on to a live market. So right on. Almost as a anyway. marketing cost. Yeah. Everybody have a Merry Christmas and safe one. Merry Christmas, oh, Kelly. You Take too, care. Kelly. Take care, Kelly. Bye-bye. Yeah. So, other? Bonnie, my question actually was answered by uh, Kathy. So so thanks for that. Um, some teamwork and uh, psychic network there. Uh, Anytime. I'll keep my psychic network going. <laughs> Uh, one thing that my market is looking at, and I actually have to do all the paperwork for it because our annual meeting is uh, in a couple weeks. Um, but so we have been technically a program um, of the market, and I am looking at turning it into a market, much in the same way as our Wednesday market is a market, um, because oh. that um, that follows. I mean. Our market's very old. We have a, a long-standing set of rules regarding what markets, you know, how they operate. Um, so we're actually looking at uh, charging the vendors a small fee to be on the platform. Um, and that would open up to other vendors who were not eligible for the program previously. So, I mean, there's a lot of changes that, that could be made. Um, as far as funding, my biggest expense, honestly, is payroll. Uh, so I, I feel like everybody's biggest expense is payroll. Yeah. But Rochester is a weird one. So, <laughs> well, thanks a lot, Ryan, for being on yeah. with us this morning. Um, yeah, for what it's worth, I don't know if I give you guys any insights or if I just bore you with numbers or what, but no, it's it's helpful, and it's helpful to hear it more than once, too, I think, because, um, you know, we all have to kind of chew on this and think it through from several different angles. So we're going to do another webinar with Ryan on December 29th for farmers. So you managers who are still on, if you can start letting your farmers know, I've got a flyer that Brett Olson put together that I'll send out to everybody, but Ryan's going to 
talk to a farmer audience on December 29th at 1 p.m. Yeah, and we're trying to invite, you know, folks that do specialty crops anywhere. <laughs> um, this, this project did afford us to, again, get data from 17 operators. That is, that's actually very rare uh, in the state of Minnesota. So that is something that's, that's actually a value to anybody that's outside of your markets there, especially crop people as well. A lot of people don't have any sense about how, I'm, how am I performing compared to other people. It just, it's just not done very often. So um, that's great. You guys are doing that Farm Finance Institute and thinking through profitability of the individual markets. Um, my only parting comment here listening to Kelly was that uh, he seems very positive about it. It sounds like people are very positive. I think, you know, big, big picture is um, if you think about your market aggregation as a business, uh, you're still you're still very much in the startup of a business. You know, I've I've spent way too much time and money firing up a grocery store from scratch that I know fairly well that um, only after three years do you even have a bit of a handle on, on how the numbers lay out. And and it's nothing to beat yourself up about or or feel bad about. It's just something to continue to noodle so that you get get to the get to where you need to be uh, because mar markets don't change very quickly and customer behavior doesn't change very quickly. I mean, COVID made it change quickly in this instance. It's the exception rather than the rule. But um, like any business, whether you're selling shoes or whether you're selling bowling balls or whatever, you know, hey, they're still very much in the startup stage. And I'm just here to remind you of that. <laughs> <laughs> it takes time. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, go ahead, Jane. Yeah, the other quick announcement I want to make for the managers who are still on is that the MDA's New Markets e-commerce cost share grant is open until January 10th, and we've been working with Brian Erickson, who's the administrator of that program, to um, clarify what the, what the guidelines are for farmers markets to use it. So uh, there's a document that you'll all be getting that kind of walks through how to use that grant to apply for funds to offset some of your expenses that weren't covered from other sources this year. So we'll be getting that out. Jane, will you be, uh, will you be sharing contact information along with that or just a, just a write-up? Uh, contact information for Brian. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I've I've also suddenly yeah I've I've suddenly become responsible for that so <laughs> I I need that documentation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's just about ready to go. I just want the project team to take one more quick look at it, and then I think we can get it out. Okay, well, thanks everyone. And if you have follow-up questions um, for Ryan, we still have um, some of his, a little bit of his time. Um, Ryan, we still have a little bit yeah, of your time, I think through a different contract to, to kind of follow up more on these 2020 numbers. So um, oh, yeah. if folks have other things they'd like, you know, part of the data you'd like to see, let us know and we can we can integrate that into, into the next Ryan, presentation. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know how deep you're going on this, um, but if you want some reports from, I mean, I, I actually do keep business books um, and they're pretty, they're pretty stringent because I'm responsible to a board. Um, so if you are interested in more in-depth data on percentages and things like that, let me know of the market costs, your costs you're incurring, right, Ruth? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that versus sales and things like that. So if you're interested in something like that from, albeit a strange market, um, I mean, 
let me know. Well, and, most, and most of that data, hopefully Ruth is getting into those spreadsheets so that they're in one place um, that Ryan can look at consistent data across the markets. Yeah, but I have like QuickBooks uh, reports if he was interested in the actual like numbers, so. You can probably stop the recording. Um, and for Ruth, her numbers aren't getting into our spreadsheets because she's using a different platform. Um, so November 1st, though, so her numbers are accurate to um, all of them that you have. Mm -hmm. I tried. Local, local food marketplace. You know, so that's totally um, got different reporting, which is awesome. But that's also where, um, and maybe you want to talk about Kathy with, you guys are doing that thing with Tara Johnson, right? About the Food Finance Institute. Yes, we are going correct. to try. Uh, so correct. And you know, I just sent Jane some notes on, it'll probably happen, you know, in the spring. Um, and, and Tara can handle between eight and 10 markets. Yeah, cause it's gonna be a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. But Ryan, you know, we'll, so if we don't have enough farmers markets that want to look at it, we would, you know, we should look again at going back to some of the people that did it before, like the Mana Food Co-op or Sprout or the Good Acre or the Shared Ground, right? I mean, anybody who kind of needs this training, this coaching, they could do it. Finland wants to, uh, the, you know, because Colby was yep. part of uh, the, the panel at our conference and he, they definitely want to be part of it. So we'll throw them in there. Well, I just think in terms of Ruth, so I don't know if I'm going to, I mean, just in terms of expectations, I mean, I like this idea of doing what Jim brought up about the change in supplier sales and to compare that 2019 to 2020 to see how that looked for the supplier end. But Ruth's point about, hey, she's got a, she's got a whole QuickBooks file and, you know, it's Tara in a one-on-one -on -one situation is most appropriate to really, yeah. in a similar yeah. way, sort that out, right? Market by market. Um, because I don't really see myself delving back in, in in that depth on the market costs, unless you guys just say, hey, we, we really want to aggregate that um, for 20 and that. You know, you, you got to give me a little direction on that. I could do that the same way I did it for 2019. Um, I'll loop back with you, Ryan, when we kind of figure out m more what we we want specifically. But yeah, that that would be a good thing for for Tara. And Ruth, if you if you've got capacity to do it, you know, the, her training will be free. What we don't have money for is to pay for your time to go through that. But the that grant will pay for that whole thing. The the four day boot camp, the, the consultations. And I would love to see Tara help, you know, cause you got enough volume there that we could get some good, good understanding. Yeah, I was, I was kind of waiting on that one because I actually, I mean, I've been running a farm for five years. I've run businesses previously. Like I'm not your prime candidate. I actually kind of do know what I'm doing. Oh, I but think no you one are, else Ruth. Is, Ruth. But if no one else are. is gonna- <laughs> No one else is going to take her up on that. I would love to take that no. training, but Ruth, but I don't want to take that away so, from someone else. <laughs> so Tara like ran a like a, a you know a national business that went into all of the whole food. So I don't think there's anybody that's run a farmers market in Minnesota that would not benefit from what Tara does. I mean, it, it's not it's not business training 101. It's um, it's really much higher level than that. I was I was more worried about uh, taking that away from someone who has less experience than I do. Yeah, um, I don't think that that's I don't think I wouldn't worry about that. I think there's open space. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, I think you should. I mean, Tara, I mean, essentially, you, you have a, a free business planning consultant for a period of time. And uh, I think she's pretty smart in the way of finances and thinking through things for yeah, individual for sure. businesses. So. Okay. Well, thanks everyone. And uh, if we, we probably won't um, see you before the end of the year. So happy holidays and new year and all that. And um, thanks again, Ryan, for yeah, uh, pleasure. time with us. All right. Bye everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.